This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. UCLA is a university with unlimited possibilities for students that desire world-class academics and research. Unmatched diversity, incredible cultural and social opportunities, successful alumni and career networking, first-class campus facilities, plus America's top intercollegiate sports teams. Located in Westwood, just a few miles from the Pacific Ocean, UCLA's one square mile campus is surrounded by famous cities such as Bel Air, Beverly Hills, Brentwood, and Santa Monica. Hi everybody and welcome to Westwood for another edition of UCLA Bruin Talk. I'm Dave Marcus, joined as always by Allison Taylor. We think you're really going to enjoy this week's show. We've got some bright new faces of the women's basketball team coming in first, and then we'll visit with a longtime Bruin who is back to campus in a new role. Before we meet our first guest, let's take a look at the upcoming events. The UCLA women's basketball team is calling the John Wooden Center their home this year, but they might have been tempted to move their games to the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. They have had to overcome a lot of adversity this year, and the story of how they're doing it is an inspiration to all of us. Very pleased to be joined by a couple of members of the UCLA team, Center Corinne Costa and Assistant Coach Tony Noonan. Welcome to UCLA Bruin Talk. Ah, thank you. Coach, we talk about the injuries this team has had to overcome. Now, I know Corey Close, the head coach, has told the team, we are not going to say the word injuries the rest of the year, and we're not going to talk about next year. But tell us the struggle this team has had to go through to keep reinventing itself. Uh, well, it seems like uh, every week we're trying to manipulate our offenses or defenses just to kind of work with uh, the roster we have that week, whether it be uh, season-long injuries or nagging injuries that keep people out for just a week. But uh, our teams persevered. They showed some mental toughness, and we're growing a lot and uh, just sticking to it and working together. Corinne, you've been a big part of that story this year. You weren't penciled in as the starter, a sophomore at six foot four. You've obviously got the size to play center, but you are now a starter and you have responded beautifully. Tell us about the mindset going from role player to starter in less than half a year. Um, I think that just over time you just kind of get used to it as you play more minutes and you just start and then it just comes along together. Coach, Dave mentioned that Corinne is now in a starting position where she wasn't before. Tell us how you've seen her grow and mature now as a starter rather than coming in as a backup. Um, well, I think it all started with just a commitment to hard work. I think uh, she saw the opportunity um, and realized that the team really needed her. I think the team asked her to step up. And uh, from that point, she just worked uh, double time. 
And uh, when you work that hard, good things are going to happen. And when good things happen, you gain a lot of confidence. And uh, we see the hard work. We see the confidence within how she plays. And you can see the confidence in her teammates. And you know, now at the beginning of the game, down the stretch, um, we're drawing up plays to go to Corinne. Corinne, you set a UCLA single game record with seven blocks against a big and very athletic Cal team. You surpassed the great Natalie Williams in the UCLA record book. Uh, tell us what that accolade meant to you. Uh, it means a lot to be able to set a record. I mean, it's UCLA, and she was a great player, so it just feels good that I could do that and be in the record books. Yeah, you're in the company of a WNBA all-star. That's pretty good stuff. <laughs> You've also made great strides on the offensive end. It looks almost effortless. Your shooting touch, 12 feet in, almost automatic this year. Is that just something that's come naturally? Um, I kind of just, I don't even think about it. It just, it seems to go in. I don't know, really, I can't take credit for it. It just goes in. <laughs> Well, so, Coach, I want to talk a little bit about the Bruins' recent road trip. It was a trip at altitude against Utah and Colorado. Both games came down to the wire. Both games, your outmanned, tired team came from behind to win the games. Tell us about the mental toughness that it takes to do that. Um, well, I just watched, so <laughs> I had a good seat for it. Um, the mental toughness is something that we've been really talking about the last couple of weeks, just or all year with the adversity that we have. And it was great to see it kind of come together on this road trip. Um, you know, the ladies, I think they just finally really, really, really want to win and want to work together to win. And going in that kind of a situation where we have to put on the full court press at the end of the game just to try to find a way to win um, with just a couple of players that are, you know, there for subs or whatever it may be even Utah we barely had half of a sub so um, it's just great to kind of show what kind of heart they have and how kind of toughness they want and just um, I think it shows that the Bruins got desire to like do whatever it takes and Corinne in that Utah game you were not feeling well in the second half in fact you spent the first part of that half in the locker room you came back out you made a gigantic shot with a couple minutes left mm -hmm. what did it take to get in there and, and, and force yourself to, to do that mental toughness I was definitely not feeling well and it just happened it was like that <laughs> <laughs> Corinne including coach Noonan this year's basketball coaching staff is pretty much all new so coming back can you tell us how it's changed what improvements have been made how do you think the new staff has affected you girls um, I think there's a lot of they care about our like how we how we prepare how we everything that we do and it just helps like confidence wise and they just pump us up the whole time and it, it makes a big difference coach your coaching background uh, 20 years experience your last eight years were at westmont which is an naia school but before that you were at oregon state and uc santa barbara and your ties with head coach corey close go way back oh yeah corey and i are good friends from uh, 20 years plus back so um, I think that really is a benefit for our staff is that all of us in some way or another um, have some type of friendships or kind of history together. And uh, even though we're all new, um, it brings us together and we have some kind of uh, relationships and togetherness. And we're on the same page, even though we're kind of working together and working things out. And I think as a team's grown, the coaching staff has grown this year as kind of how to figure things out together and what roles we play and stuff. The other members of the staff are Jenny Huth, who was Jenny Royer when she played at Colorado, Big 12 all Big 12 team three years in a row, and Shannon Perry, who was a very prominent coach at Duke and before that at some other school across town. Yeah. Um, again, you had to, to meld a lot of different coaching styles having not worked together, but it seems like you've really got it rolling now. Well, I think that's the players got it rolling. You know, I think we're kind of still encouraging the players, still teaching them, but, um, you know, for what the coaching staff does, ours is preparation. Ours is getting the team prepared and confident that they're going to do the right thing out there. And uh, it's up to the players when it comes game time. The focal point of so many discussions through the fall and into the winter now is the renovation of Poly Pavilion. And since that's going on, you guys are playing in the John Wooden Center on Collins Court. How has that affected your game? I know the volleyball team and the gymnastics team love competing in there because it's a great environment. So how do you guys feel about it? Um, I actually like it because like, when it's packed, it's like, Everyone's right there, and it's loud, and it's fun. It's a good, it's a good feeling when it's when we're all in there together. 
Corinne, you were a tremendous volleyball player when you were in high school. You went to high school in Northern California, in Brentwood, but yes. not the Brentwood that's no. next to the UCLA campus, uh, Northern San Francisco Bay. Mm. And um, when you were looking at colleges, what attracted you to come down south to UCLA? Um, I think Coach Nikki Caldwell had a lot to do with that. She kind of sucked me in. Um, it was just the best option. I, I've always kind of thought about UCLA and then just planned out right, I guess. Now, we were talking before the show about signing day and what an extravaganza has become a lot of places. Your signing day, you were the only one in your area that signed the, uh, uh, tell us what that was like. Um, it was kind of cool. Everyone like knew about it, so I had a lot of support from like the whole city or the whole town, I guess, and it just felt good. Like everyone knew, and it was fun. Coach, one of your duties, of course, not only coaching and practices and in the games, but is recruiting. It's the lifeblood of college athletics. That's a pretty demanding job during the season, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, last week on our road trip, uh, not only did we have to fly to Utah and Colorado, but I flew to Portland. I flew from Colorado back to Long Beach and then back to Colorado for the game. And um, so, yeah, during the season, it's some uh, long hours, lots of flights and uh, lots of phone calls. But uh, it's uh, what we need to do. I mean, that's, you know, how we develop great teams is bringing in great players, great people, and we got to spend some time doing our work and finding out not only are they great talents, but what other things are they going to bring to the university. And I imagine on a team that is going to be together for hopefully four years, you've really got to find the right personalities to, to mix with your coaching style and with the teammates. Oh yeah, no, we're looking for defenders, scorers, vocal leaders, you know, people that bring energy, people that bring leadership. I mean, it's just trying to get a good mix of whatever it means, you know, to have a great team. You can't have 12, 15 of the same type of people. You need a good mixture so we can all learn from each other and bring different strengths. The young lady sitting next to you is one of the most improved players, not only on the team, but probably in the Pac-12. But you've got a bunch of them this year, a lot of players who've been asked to do things they never had a chance to do. Your point guard, Mariah Williams, Thea Lemberger, basically didn't play last year. They have taken a prominent role. That was the off-season question, who's going to play point for the Bruins? They've been a great surprise, haven't they? Oh, yeah. No, they, uh, hey, I think what I've learned over the years is you give somebody an opportunity and they're going to step up. You know, there may be some growing pains along the way, but when it comes time, everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to have that opportunity to be a starter, be a contributor. And um, even though we graduated a lot of great players from last year on the perimeter, um, yeah, Mariah and uh, Thea have done a great job handling the ball, taking care of it. And when they've been injured or foul trouble, even Rebecca Gardner's had to play a little bit of point guard for us at times. And she's reluctant to do it, but she does it what she needs for the team. Well, I know you spoke about developing the whole person. One of the things this Bruin team has been doing is been giving back. There was a great event when the team went to Philadelphia where the team actually gave back to the community, went to the community center that Markel Walker played at when she was a kid. Tell us about that event. Um, that was pretty special. I mean, it was, it was special in the fact that just to kind of like um, be there and see what Markel's family and community was all about. And, uh, you know, the service we did is something that, you know, I'm accustomed to. Again, I grew up with uh, Coach Corey, and um, you know we've done a lot of that kind of stuff before in our past. And just to kind of bring that to the Bruins and um, give back and show our players that it really is fun to kind of be in that kind of a situation. And when you look back at it, you know, a couple months, uh, you know, gone now from it, um, it's definitely one of the highlights of the year. Corinne, tell us about the emphasis that this team has put on becoming well-rounded people and giving back. Um, we work on it daily. Always talk. Our theme is uncommon and being uncommon, practicing uncommon, preparing uncommon, being uncommon people by giving and in every in every aspect of our lives. She wants us to be uncommon and carry that out. And early in the season, the Bruins were coming up just a bit short. A couple of four-point losses. You know, really close games. Now the Bruins are winning those games. What do you think's been the difference that's helped UCLA get? over that obstacle? Well, I, th I think experience. I mean, experience for our players. We've had a lot of players who started the season who really hadn't played. I mean, in our first game, uh, I believe Rama Gardner and Thea Lemberger scored more points, played more minutes than they did like the entire year last year. And also, you know, just experience with the coaching staff, just kind of figuring out game-ending scenarios. We were in a lot of game-ending scenarios early on and 
going back and watching the film and see what works. But more importantly, I think it's just confidence that our players have gotten through competing, being in those situations, being successful, working together uncommonly, and uh, building that tight bond. So when it comes crunch time, not only do they want to win, but they want to win for the person next to them. Well, it's been great to watch the team's development as you fight through adversity. The home schedule's almost winding down, but the Pac-12 tournament is in Los Angeles, and you can find all the information about it on UCLABruins.com. Thank you once again for joining us on UCLA Bruin Talk. And we're going to be right back with more Bruin Talk after this brief public service announcement. A trophy can be made just about anywhere. But there's one place where champions are made. UCLA champions meet here. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Bruin Talk. It is now time to honor our Student Athlete of the Week. This week, we honor Thomas Amberg as our Student Athlete of the Week. This week, he was named MPSF Player of the Week after breaking two school records in UCLA sweeps of Cal State Northridge and UCSB. Amberg, a senior, recorded 10 block assists against the Matadors, breaking Paul Johnson's record and then proceeded to record six additional block assists against UCSB. In total, Amberg has registered 368 total blocks, as well as 333 block assists in his volleyball career. Congratulations, Thomas, and good luck with the rest of the season. If you would like additional information about UCLA athletics, please visit our website at uclabruins.com. It's our great treat to be joined by one of the great names in UCLA Bruins football history. Four-year starter at safety, he's got two Super Bowl rings as a member of the Dallas Cowboys. A familiar broadcast professional for his work on Fox, he's back on campus now as a director of scholarship development. It's wonderful to welcome James Washington to Bruin Talk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Tell us about your involvement now in this new role as the director of scholarship developments. What does that encompass? Well, in detail. We have 24 teams, and my job is to raise money for the 24 teams as far as scholarships, but I also get the benefit in raising money for the football program as well. Tell us about the importance of athletic scholarships to these young men and women that are aided by this aid. Well, let's just go back to my story. You know, I was a kid from South Central Los Angeles and had an opportunity to re receive a scholarship to UCLA, and it was a life-changing experience. Um, um, coming where you know I didn't have a mom or dad and had a dream to go to college but no way it, I could afford it um, so to be able to do that and get my degree from UCLA has been even bigger than winning two Super Bowls but then you have an opportunity to give back and when I had an opportunity to be a part of the scholarship program I was elated because the fact that I have an opportunity to go out and raise money for you know our champions that um, compete may it be men may it be women um, all together it has been a fantastic journey for me I'm gonna try to pass over the fact that you were a Super Bowl champion for my hometown <laughs> team and move on um, what has it been like to come back to campus now as an administrator rather than as a student athlete have things changed what's what's your outlook now <laughs> It's kind of amazing because as an athlete, we kind of stayed on the, the west side of campus. Um, I was part of a fraternity when I was here, so that was still part of the west side of campus. Um, coming back as an administrator, I didn't realize how big UCLA. You know, I, I, I was a part of the college, so therefore I spent most of my time on the north side of campus. Um, I was a history major, minored in psychology, so I spent most of my time on the north side, not the south side. Every time I walked to the south side, it seemed that I was getting a headache. So it's scary I down said, there. <laughs> so what I've learned as an administrator, that this is a big place. Um, and it's not just about the athletics. Athletics is a small component that it's a big city within a city. You've always had a spirit of giving, though. When 1993, you helped found an organization called Shelter 37, your uniform number. Yes. Tell us about what that program has done for people. Well, that program, it actually started out as 
I built a couple shelters, you know, for the homeless when I was playing after I won my first Super Bowl here at the Rose Bowl, actually, in 93. Um, um, after that particular game, it was a big story. I had worked with a lady called Sweet Alice in, um, in the area that I grew up in, in South Central Los Angeles, and we had teamed up and started building shelter for men, shelter for women, um, battered women. And then, as I retired, I changed it over to something that was dear to my heart, and it was more for at-risk kids. And since I've retired um, from football, the focus has been focusing on changing the lives of at-risk kids and giving them opportunity. Um, through Shelter 37, we do football camps, free football camps, where 500 kids get an opportunity to come and play. We feed them, we give them jerseys, and then UCLA staff comes out and coaches them. Um, we take 5,000 kids to three different UCLA games and we put, provide the buses. It's kind of like I'm going to college program. That's been a magnificent thing started by the athletic department at UCLA. And then scholarships. We're able to raise money and give and, and support scholarships to students at other different colleges like the junior colleges where they can't afford to go. I'm able to raise money and pay for four years or two years or whatever they need you know, at that level. I remember my first opportunity to give back to my high school was through Shelter 37, where I provided, you know, helmets for the entire team. I invited pads and uniforms for the entire team. And, you know, they still talk about those things. When you have an opportunity, you know, to come from where I came from, and now my job is to raise money to give back, I mean, you know, I'm kind of living in a bubble. Even though I've won a couple Super Bowls in Dallas, yes. this is still a dream for me. I'm still kind of living on that high because I'm back at a university that I love and dearly cherish in my heart. James, a lot of people watching don't realize how much money is needed to support the athletic scholarships for the university. This is stuff that's raised on the outside mm -hmm. through people like you, but through a lot of Bruin fans who, mm -hmm. who are donors. How can people get involved in helping support the athletics? Well, basically what you have to do, and it's you can go to um, thewittenfund.com. You can go to the website and learn more about the different types of scholarships where we have endowments where you can endow full scholarships. We have two 282 scholarships. I have a goal as a director is before I leave here, I would like to have every scholarship for every athletic sport that we have, that's men and women, I would like those scholarships to be completely endowed. Um, we have opportunities where you can give to individual sports. So if you go to um, thewittenfund.com, you'll be able to pick that up. You've become a broadcaster, you've become an administrator. A lot of great things have happened to you. When did you begin to kind of put that all in perspective? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this, and, and I'll be real frank with you. Um, I had a rough childhood, so to even have an opportunity to go to college was reaching the mountaintop. I remember when Coach Donahue came and sat on the couch in my grandmother's um, house, and he said that he was gonna give me a scholarship. And I always wanted to come to UCLA, but I just didn't think that I could survive here. And he says, we'll put every tool around you that you can be successful. And Terry Donahue held up to his word. You know, may it be the tutoring, may it be all the other things that he has helped me and he's my mentor to this day. And this is when I was a young kid, about 16, because I was a midterm graduate and I came in early. So um, to have that opportunity and what it meant to me to receive a scholarship was special. But not only that, to be able to come to this fine university where I met my wife when I was 18 and I'm still married to her. Um, I met her in Haynes Hall and that alone, you know, and the beautiful kids and my beautiful offsprings that I had with her is all because of this place and that's, it's just, you know, I'm not going to start crying on TV. <laughs> yeah, but it means a lot to me. You're not used to being the one who's being interviewed. You notice right? that, though, yeah, huh? You, you like being on the other yeah, side yeah, of the yeah, table. Yeah, I like, to, I like to put the tough ones out there <laughs> on somebody, you know? But, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. How difficult is it getting to know an entire new staff like this year with the transition in UCLA football? How, how much do you have to work with them in your goals to get people motivated to contribute to the program? Well, it's kind of easy for me because I have a history. Say, for example, 
Rick Neuheisel I played with. Carl Durrell I had played with. So the, when I was around here, those guys, it was easy. The cool thing now is that Jim Moore, me and his father did a radio show for six years together. I've had a relationship with our head coach for about, probably about 25 years. And then most of the people that's on the staff, we kind of grew up in the same area together playing, may it be the NFL, may it be you know, playing at the next level. Um, so we all have a, a bond together. And it's kind of amazing to watch some of the older and the younger people work so hard. And you're talking about Jim Moore and what he's put in. Everybody was questioned. Well, you know, he's never been at this level. He's never recruited before. But you know what he brings is a work ethic. And he, been, he has been relentless in the recruiting field to accomplish what he's accomplished. And on the tip of every recruit right now, they're questioning, should I go to UCLA? And that hasn't been for a long time, you know, over, you know, Rick has done a wonderful job, but it was just Rick. He has an entire staff that's doing what he has to do. And he has guys that are, guys that go set up and Moore is definitely a closer. <laughs> You've alluded to kind of the close-knit unity of UCLA football, and really the entire athletic department is like that, but you've helped coordinate the then, now, forever tent, which is the football alumni tent. Mm -hmm. That has to be satisfying to see your old teammates come back, old coaches, everybody back together at the football games. You know what? The, the amazing thing, uh, when I sat back and we started this thing probably um, Rick's first year, um, probably about four years ago. Um, I had presented the idea to Carl Durrell, but it was a lot of things going on at that time. But I used to walk around Lot H at the Rose Bowl, which is where all the tents are set up, and I um, used to see former guys from the 60s, from the 40s, they out tailgating. And when Rick Neuheisel first got here, I went and said, hey Rick, I, we need to figure out how to have a tent for the former guys and Rick was right on it. And, and I give him credit, so I'm not gonna, I came up with the idea, but I give him credit for making it happen. And as long as I live, I owe him, because what he has done, I had an event the other night for, for Jim Moore at, at one of the donors' homes that brought in probably over 200 former athletes, and we had a guy there from 1947, class of 1947, and we had a guy there from the class of 2010. And all I can do is smile because when I sh had this idea in my head, that's what I wanted. I wanted guys to be able to network. James Washington, hey. thanks so much for joining us on Bruin Talk. Hey, thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. Allison and I will be back next time with another great show. Until then, so long from Westwood.